My name is Jorge Ferrer, I'm the chair of the Department of East-West Psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies. And uh, in addition to chairing the department, and, uh, I teach classes on transpersonal studies, transpersonal psychology, a branch of psychology including the spiritual dimension of the human being. I also teach classes on comparative mysticism and also on embodied spiritual inquiry or how to bring the fullness of who, are, who we are to, to inquire together in spiritual matters. And then finally, classes our transpersonal perspectives on sexuality and relationships. But uh, definitely, this vision of like uh, this image of like Sorba, the Buddha, you know, is you know speaks about the like, integration of the the lamb vital, you know, the, the life force, you know, immanent life, spiritual life, and the spiritual consciousness, you know, the the, the equanimity, the compassion, you know, you know, fully integrated with our balls. In the case of men, of course. Yes. <laughs> We're not filming this, right? <laughs> yes, we are. Oh, but, but this yes, is not we are. <laughs> this is this is how we trick you. This That's is how great. we trick you. That's great. <laughs> We're talking about different forms of relationships: loving one person, yes. loving two or three people at the same time, mm -hmm. and not identifying with any of that. Um, to some viewers, this may sound very abstract. Our, our yes. conversation. Let, let's make it really, really, mm -hmm. really tangible and concrete. Well, what are we talking about, and what what, yes. what, what do you recommend? Okay. Well, um, um, as I mentioned before, uh, the um, the paradigm of open relationship I would gravitate would be one that, uh, that I think is the most prevalent. You know, that uh, you have one primary relationship that is like your primary partner, and that's the person that you love. Full, all full chakras, you know, get awakening with this person, sexually and emotionally, in a soul level, you're in love with the soul of this person, right? So that's, that's that, you know. But um, in my experience, like, um, uh, that relationship would be an access, you know, an access in my life from which I could also have different contacts with different people, other women, you know, in particular, because I'm mostly heterosexual, you know, and uh, in which uh, I would have like different combination of chakras opening, you know. For example, with one could be just an expression that would be most purely sexual, you know. Uh, of course, always in a container of like uh, care and respect, you know. With other people would be uh, more emotional, you know, and would be like a more physical connection and, uh, and cuddling and really like uh, connecting from the heart, you know. With so it could be a mix of both, you know. So I think there's like a full spectrum of the ways that we can connect with other people, you know. Once you break or you overcome the monocentric or monogamous paradigm that tells you that intimate contact can only happen with one single partner, you know, mm -hmm. that's very limiting, you know, when you consider that full spectrum of like a possibilities of, co of connecting with a variety of individuals, you know. So um, that I hope that that helps a little in terms like giving a bit more flesh of to what I was referring to. Yes. So somebody is struggling with whether they should open their relationship or not. What would, you, what would you say to them? Well, um, the first thing I would say is that they need to uh, keep on struggling. <laughs> uh, especially, uh, especially, I mean, especially important is that to realize that uh, we all, we have all been kind of like uh, conditioned by uh, monocentrism, you know. So we have not only been the victims of socially enforced monogamy, but uh, this has been internalized internalizing what I call psychologically enforced monogamy, you know. So we have like this strong, strong forces within us, you know, condition is that tell us that that's really the right way to have relationships, right? Also we're bombed with movies and songs, you know, all of them kind of like, you know, perpetuating that kind of paradigm, you know. If you add to that, like that very few of us have had an optimal childhood and we come to relationships with fears of abandonment, you know, and jealousy, those two come together very strongly towards feeling, no, 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 monogamy is what I want to do. So uh, the first thing is to really realize uh, if, you know, is that, is this a free choice? This is the inquiry. Is this, this a free choice or is this something that has been kind of really conditioned culturally, psychologically, at so many levels within my being? And that's a very hard inquiry to face and to develop in a very honest way, you know, because it's very easy to fall into some kind of like a, you know, relational spiritual bypassing, you know, in which like, um, you know, I'm choosing monogamy because it's the spiritually more correct option, it's the sacred relationship, but this choice very often it's kind of hiding like uh, serious difficulties, you know, to open okay. relationships. So what you're saying is to a couple who's, who's struggling with, with that question is, yes. is to, to, to remain in the struggle and to, to, to actually 
to actually ch look at it as a good thing. It's look a good, at it, it's, it's a good thing. This, this struggle, this tension is a good thing. One person correct. wants to open the relationship. Correct. And they need to be very clear that they do want to open the relationship. They, they need to see the value in it. They need to want to transform jealousy into sympathetic general compassion. They, they need to see the value in that, in that avenue. Otherwise, uh, why to go there? Some years ago, I, I met a woman, American woman, very sensual, very, very attractive woman who was married to a Brazilian man. Yeah. And she told me a story that I've uh, always remembered and, and shared many times because I, th I think it is, it is, it is very, uh, very important message here. So she married her, her, her lover, the Brazilian man, mm -hmm. and the day after the, from the day after the wedding, he stopped wanting her sexually. They had no more sex. Sure. And when I met her, it was about a year after they got yeah. married. And she says, I, I got enough of the mm -hmm. situation. I had, I had no sex the whole year. Yes. So I said to my husband, I love you and I will never leave you, but I'm going to see other men. Sure. And the husband, Brazilian, uh, was freaking out. Yeah. <laughs> totally freaking out. Sure. Ended up having to surrender to his very strong-willed wife mm -hmm. uh, doing this. Mm -hmm. And he also had to go out and find other women. Yes. And ultimately, they got back together. Yeah. Yes, that's, that's a possibility and that's great, but that's risky. It's risky <laughs> because more often than not, when people take those, those directions without a container of psycho-spiritual growth and a togetherness and walking together in that direction, more often than not, uh, they're going to move apart, you know. But um, for me, like uh, if a couple, they would really want to walk in that direction, you know, there is certain kind of practices that can be done, you know. Ideally, uh, you know, psychotherapeutic container with like kind of like a container, you know, it's always risky to do them on your own. But, but yes. what I think is, is crucial to identify is that sometimes in a marriage or in a, in a, in a commitment, in a monogamous commitment, people shut down sexually, yes. both men and women. Correct can totally shut down if they have to be the good wife or the good husband. Correct. And, and sometimes the key is to say, well, take your freedom and uh, help yes. yourself. And <laughs> yes, very often uh, many, many, many uh, couples, uh, their sexuality has been rekindled and uh, reconnected after they have some kind of like selective opening. So that's, kind of, that's kind of the, the message, I think, of the, of, of the story. That's, yeah, that's part of it. And I think, uh, I think kind of like that kind of conscious selective opening can actually help towards the longevity of relationships. You know, we live in a paradigm of serial monogamy. People are changing partners every year, three years. The three and seven years each, yes, you know. Yes. It's like this. This is the new paradigm. It's not long-term monogamy. It's serial monogamy, right? But uh, and I've always felt very dissatisfied with that paradigm. It's like very mercantilistic. And uh, I think there is something about staying, staying with one person for a long, long, long time in terms of spiritual depth and emotional depth, you know. So my inquiry has always been forced, paradoxically, what can help couples to stay together for longer time, you know. Mm -hmm. And definitively, I think what you're pointing to about like uh, some selective focus Happening, uh, at certain moments, you know, it can rekindle the passion in a, in, a, in a couple, you know. So you were asking before what, what people can do if they really want to go in that direction, right? So instead of like exploring uh, each one on their own, you know, like uh, one possibility that uh, we, in the context of the holistic sexuality world, we have worked with some couples in that context, is that, uh, you know, the, this practice that you can uh, gradually desensitize yourself, you know, and explore jealousy in a safe container. And this practice can start very simple with like seeing your partner giving a massage to a third person, someone for opposite sex, you know, with their clothes on, you know, and you're witnessing your partner touching someone else and you have like a note and you write down what's, what's, what's been awakening yourself, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. what's the, uh, is jealousy, what's, what's going on, you know, and you inquire that later mm -hmm. with your partner, mm -hmm. with therapies and so forth, you know. But of course, this is like a first step, you know, you can move into do a massage with less clothing, you know. You can move into other explorations, for example, having a partner at some point uh, do a more, uh, you know, instinctive exploration of the body of another person, you know, using the sense of smell, for example, in the sense of taste, for example, you know, what is being awakened there, you know, and you can start moving gradually into more even like uh, sexual positions without having sex, you know, sexual positions. What happens when I see my partner actually in a sexual position with someone else? What's been awakened? But this needs to be, of course, a very gradual process 
of desensitization, you know, and ideally a process that should be contained by skilled therapists or people who can, otherwise could be very tricky and could backfire in a couple. It's very delicate when you move in those directions, as you can imagine. I read your article um, uh, about spirituality and uh, relationships, mm -hmm. uh, polyamory and monogamy and beyond. Yes. Is that what it is? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and what I, the way I understand your article is that um, you are wanting to move to a place where we don't label ourselves mm -hmm. as, as one or the other, but we can choose in any situation whatever is the most loving thing to do. The, the most loving form of the relationship, is that right? Yes, I think that's correct. Like, uh, and I call that uh, space that is catalyzed by a movement beyond monogamy and polyamory, I've called it relational freedom. So both like those categories, you know, like the, uh, they can become very liberating for people at different points of their lives, but also they can become boxes, they can become ideologies, you know. I identify myself with being monogamous, you know, I identify myself with being polyamorous, you know, and once you identify with one of the other, you start like looking down uh, those people who are not like you. It's a kind of like a relation. It creates separation. It creates separation. La labeling and, and identifying with one particular... Correct. It's a kind of like, a, also, you know, like uh, we humans have a tendency towards narcissism, right? It's like uh, in religious matters, you know, I'm a Christian and therefore there is always like a Christian or Buddhist or New Age, whatever you may want, may want to call it, and, but there's always the tendency once I identify myself with being a Buddhist or a Christian or whatever the spiritual choice I have, you know, to believe that my choice is not only really the best for me, but it's kind of somehow universally superior to others. So I think in the relational realm we see the same, and uh, you can see the same uh, in so many books written by pro-monogamy authors and also to pro-polyamory -poly authors, you know, in which they kind of in like in a explicit or more subtle ways, they kind of like put down the other camp, you know. For example, monogamous people, you know, normally talk and think about polyamorous people as people who cannot commit, they're emotionally immature, yeah. they're hedonistic, they're narcissistic, you know, they are fearful, you know, they, they are just not have their shit bad together. Press. You, you call yes. it, in your article, you call it, they have, it has a bad press. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, and then, the, but in the, from the other perspective, happens the same, like polyamorous people also tend to look down at monogamous people, you know. There are people who are kind of hypocritical because they are thinking actually about, they have desires for others, but they don't want to admit or they don't want to act upon them, you know, or also they feel that there's people who are not in contact with essential dimensions of love, you know, that is non-possessive and expansive, you know. So there is like this kind of like what I call uh, the monopoly wars that are starting to emerge in our culture, you know. And I think we're going to be seeing much more of that kind of monopoly wars that are fostered by uh, what I call monopride and polypride, you know, the, the deep-seated belief that my relational style, either monogamous or polyamorous, is the best, is the best psychologically or developmentally, morally or ethically, or more spiritually correct, and so forth, you know. And where do you think we should be going? <laughs> <laughs> That's my inquiry, that has been my inquiry all my life. Uh, you know, uh, when I first, I uh, was born in Barcelona in Spain, and uh, when I first entered the realm of relationships, uh, I realized that I didn't fit in the monocentric or monogamist paradigm that uh, surrounded me, you know. Uh, I remember how, how did you find, find out? Can you, can you tell us? Yes, tell uh, absolutely. Like uh, I was walking in the streets of Barcelona with my first girlfriend, uh, my first steady girlfriend, and then suddenly like, the shocking realization that uh, to be with this beautiful woman in a really a stable and serious relationship meant that I couldn't express my embodied love to anyone else in the entire planet of all the other millions and millions of people it struck me as something completely crazy. And uh, I was starting to struggle with that through many, many years. And, uh, and your girlfriend, of yeah. course, was Catholic and, and, friend, and yeah. wasn't open to this conversation. She wasn't very Catholic, <laughs> but definitely she was very monogamous and uh, it was uh, as, as well as most of the people around me, you know. So that's something that I think that many poly people have felt. They have felt, you know, in the same way that like uh, gay men and women felt, you know, back in the... 60s and 70s and 80s, and they still feel in many in many places in the world and in the states. You know, I think many po naturally poly people, they you know they feel the effect of what we can call polyphobia. You know, like a kind of kind of like a and polyphobia can be both 
What, what, is, what is polyphobia? Well, polyphobia would be like kind of like the, the subtle judgment towards polyamory uh, as being kind of, uh, you know, there could be a, like a fear towards it, a kind of like a moral condemnation, even some kind of disgust or some kind of like a spiritual condensation towards it, you know. So uh, and polyphobia can be both uh, externalized. So I externalize this towards poly people, you know, uh, but also it can be internalized. So many polyamorous people who we have, and, and that happened to me growing up in Barcelona in those times, I kind of internalized polyphobia. I was feeling basically, essentially, what's wrong with me? Yeah. What's wrong with me that I don't fit in, the, in what everybody's talking that love should be about, right? Is there anything wrong with me? And uh, I should go to the psych psychotherapies, you know? I should like fix myself. Mm -hmm. what's, what's really going on, you know? And uh, so it can be accompanied by self-doubt and self-criticism and ultimately even by cynicism and depression and, and lead to serious consequences, you know? I think that there are many, many men and women, you know, that they suffer from internalized polyphobia, you know, in our culture. That they, they, they are very hard on themselves. They judge themselves when they find themselves loving more than one person or being attracted. Yes. Yes, yes. and when they find themselves like in love with their partners and at the same time desiring sexually other people, you know, and they have like this kind of like a conflict, yeah. conflict yeah. inside. Yes. And they feel, well, there is must be something wrong with me. Yes. But, uh, you know, when I was working in Barcelona and uh, even later here in California, like uh, some of my friends would ask me, Jorge, but why do you want to love? you know, sexually more than one person. Mm -hmm. And for me, like, the question, that wasn't, that wasn't the right question. The question for me was, why not? Why wouldn't you want to love more people in this life in fuller ways, you know? What's prevent human beings? What is preventing? What is blocking us from loving more, you know? In ways that are not just... Uh, in, what, in fuller ways, and what I mean by that is the ways that integrate, um, you know, eros and also emotional love and spiritual love, you know? Uh, this comes from the, you probably know, the, from the Greek distinction between Eros, Philia, and Agape, that also the Christian tradition kind of like uh, dissociated, you know. You know, God was supposed to be all Agape, and Eros was something that animals and human beings who are sinful we used to do, you know. But of course, that's a very dissociated view of love. Love is multidimensional and it's vibrating at all these frequencies. And it's a dissociated view of the divine, right? The divine is both, it's Agape. It's philia, but it's eros too, right? And this is what I think many people in your program I live are telling, right? That uh, the erotic is a force that is also spiritual and is divine. Yes. Mm -hmm. There is a, a theory that there is the forces of sex, love, and eros. Where sex is more the animalistic drive. Correct. And, uh, love is the heart and is not necessarily sexual. Mm -hmm. And eros is... Uh, the erotic, Correct. Some, somewhat mixed with love. Exactly. But, and sex is the purely animalistic. Exactly. And, 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 and those three forces yes. work through Exactly. Us. And unfortunately, there was a kind of like a descriptive truth around that in many cases because, because precisely because sexuality has not been as conscious as it could be, because it has not been integrated with the love of the heart and the spiritual consciousness and the light, you know in many men and in many women to go there at certain times and even today, it, they would become more animalistic, you know? And there, there is something about like being able to mindfully ex explore the more animalistic dimensions of sexuality that could be valuable, you know? But ideally also like uh, you want to, with a partner, you want to move in a full chakra open communion with them, you know? With eros and your heart open and, uh, and your, the light of your consciousness on, you know? So there was a descriptive truth there you know, in this kind of view, you know, but it's not an absolute view, you know, that we can integrate, you know, eros and with the heart, you know, and then eros becomes also, it's just not animalistic, there's a dimension of tenderness in the instinct that can emerge, right? And when it's integrated with uh, consciousness, you know, the erotic impulse uh, achieves kind of like an intelligence, like an uh, evolutionary unfolding, you know? Mm -hmm. For example, when in my own work, personal work, when those center synergies became more integrated, uh, I found myself that uh, my sexual energy would awaken in the right measure with the right people in the right circumstances. Something that didn't happen before would be someone very sexually attractive and I would be like very aroused. Mm -hmm. But when all those centers were integrated, it wasn't like any kind of control top down. Right. It was just natural organic unfolding of yeah. the sexual energy because of the integration of the centers. Nice, yeah. Mm -hmm.
So uh, what I what I sense about you is like you you have a, a really big heart. You you you're full of love and uh, and you also uh, are very driven to to understand uh, spiritual understanding. Yes. And, uh, Philosophy, psychology. Yes. Uh, very strong. Yes. Yeah. In my work uh, at CIF and in my written work, like uh, most most of my written work has been actually about the spirituality and uh, also bringing the spirituality into education and uh, and in many facets of life. So these relationships and sexuality, it's like a personal inquiry that I've always had in my life. I've done some writing about it. I used to teach some classes at at CIS, the California Institute of Integral Studies. You know. And uh, I think I'm going to be doing more of that in the future because I'm writing a, a book on this, you know. So yes, I know you're writing a book on mm -hmm. on, on love. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the title is uh, it's still a many at least two or three years until they come. So we'll do another show hopefully <laughs> when it's coming. Uh, this is going to be called. I think the title is the right the right to love. The right to love. The right to love, and the subtitle will be something like uh, spirituality, sexuality, and evolutions of hum intimate relationships. Or perhaps like something about monogamy, polyamory, and beyond. You know, and we'll be guided by that question: What lies beyond monogamy and polyamory? In my own evolution from a socially enforced monogamic culture, you know, coming here into the Bay Area and encounter a more open culture mm -hmm. and many people that's, that's why you came in here. polyamory. You, you, you knew uh, where, to, where to go. I, yes. I, yes. I came for CIS, you know, to get my PhD there and stuff. But I uh, encountered all, also this more open culture, you know, and uh, but also I don't, I didn't fully resonate with a lot of the police circles here in California. There was like this, you know, what I call before the mono pride. There was like this. I don't know, uh, and for me, uh, it was like always like, what's 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 beyond those boxes? What's beyond those potential ideologies that we put ourselves saying? What's beyond monogamy and polyamory? You know, who are some of the people you have admired or have been your your teachers and and mm -hmm. sources of inspiration? Too many to uh, count. We need like a <laughs> tour's interview, some, some but uh, one one key person. Um, uh, well, it's a couple. Is uh, his name is Ramon Alvareda and Marina Romero. That uh, we discuss. Uh, I mentioned uh, you to her. Uh, so um, they created this body of work called holistic sexuality uh, in Spain many many years ago, and I was kind of like uh, influenced by their work and some of the values of their work. I was instrumental in bringing the work to the states, and uh, since then we offer workshops together in Esalen Institute as well as at CIS and many other places. So um, that body of work. Uh, it's interesting. It gives like a direct reference to people about how um, you know structure, safe contact, intimate contact with many others could be a tool for integral growth. You know, so she is somebody you hired, I think, or hired in one of the courses. So I, Marina I was, Romero. Yes, I was asking. I, yes, I was thinking who, in terms of spiritual leaders, or um, mm -hmm. uh, or uh, leaders in the field of. Psychology, mm -hmm. or yeah, <laughs> it's tricky. Like uh, I mean, in terms of spiritual leaders, like uh, uh, I mean, I have my you know some you know sp you know classical figures, you know, like poets, like Hafiz, you know, that I love, you know, any any spiritual figure that they were moving to the direction of like uh, integrating the more sensual and the more subtle. I felt that I was feeling drawn, but unfortunately, as we all know, most spiritual leaders, even today, you know, uh, they hold certain views around sexuality that are not extremely positive, you know. So still, we are in a spiritual culture that values more the development of what I call a heart chakra spirituality, and a spirituality that is mostly focused on the cultivation of the, you know, subtle dimensions of the heart, equanimity, compassion, and also high states of consciousness, you know. So I'm, I've been an advocate of what I call a fully embodied spirituality. Mm -hmm. It's a full chakra spirituality mm -hmm. that is really about the integration of all centers, you know. And it's not even tantric, anyway. No, I understand. A lot of difference be between the culture here and the culture in Europe, in yes. Spain, in Holland, where I'm from, yes. in terms of dating and yes. how, how men and women behave. Correct. And how they are being men and women. And, um, Absolutely. <laughs> uh, do you have a lot of contact with Spain and, and do you actually contribute uh, <laughs> do, do you do you do things in Spain? Yeah, yes. Uh, I go there uh, every year, year and a half, in a way to recharge mm -hmm. my batteries, you know. Mm -hmm. There is something, I love the Bay Area, I love the state, there is so many things here, there is so much cutting, it's thinking, there is, 
Uh, here, what I think is great about the Bay Area and uh, states in general, you know, is like the open-mindedness, you know, to, to experiment, you know, to push the envelope to the next thing, you know. So countries like in Europe, I think they tend to be a bit more conservative in some areas, you know. On the other hand, like uh, uh, there, there is like more rootedness, you know, there's more groundedness, you know. I think we need both. We need to be really rooted and groundedness, you know, and then be also open to experiment, you know. I find here in the Bay Area that many people are open to experiment and move the energy a lot, but in a not very grounded way. So they often don't integrate uh, their experiences, you know. They have all these tantric experiences, ecstatic experiences, medicine experiences. Mm -hmm. But later uh, at the time of like uh, transformations, real transformations in the everyday life, in the relationships, it's harder. It's, it's harder. harder. Yeah. You well, know? you come from a from a very Catholic uh, yes. culture, mm -hmm. uh, which has a very different view on on sexual relationships. So, yes. So, uh, no wonder that you experience the Bay Area as very yes. very open. <laughs> sure. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> There's the whole Catholic background, and totally. I mean the whole conversation about polyamory. I mean, mm -hmm. you should bring it back home. And no, no, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's opening there. It's There's opening. There, there is many polyamorous movements there. And uh, I mean, I was lucky enough to, I was like in a um, Catholic school for 12 years, but uh, it was like a more feminine orientation. The object of devotion with the Virgin Mary, with the Marian brothers. We never received a very oppressive repressive uh, education and also my parents were both very liberal in many ways so I didn't I didn't came with a big big repression there you know um, I, I always like credit my mother you know to uh, give me some kind of like a baseline you know from which I feel I can in a safe way to explore you know uh, and I think that's part of what we'll need like uh, more conscious parenting so that when we become adults have a, you know, what is called a secure attachment style, right? And yes. I know that you have had a program around yes. this here recently. Yes. And, uh, and of course, from that secure attachment style is when you can have the more wholesome incarnations or versions of both monogamy and polyamory. Yes. Hey, Jorge, I think you are a, a, a breath of fresh air. Oh, in, good. In, 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 <laughs> Thank in, you. In, as a fellow European, and I've seen the curriculum of the... Uh, of of what you're doing in the at the institute and very open-minded mm -hmm. the the program about sexuality mm -hmm. um, what you bring in there about prostitution and mm -hmm. and empowerment and uh, mm -hmm. women's work it's mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, very very impressive thank mm -hmm. you for being here today and mm -hmm. for being uh, uh, transparent and and open and uh, in conversation about these things. Thanks to you, Max, and thanks for this wonderful program you're putting together. It's so important for our culture, so it's an honor to, to have been here and having been invited. This was Private Matters. I'm Max van Prague, thriving in your life through intimacy. See you next time. Si vos creven, no tas creven. Si vos que se, no tas que se. Até o dia que vou voltar Se vou escrever, me não está a escrever Se vou esquecer, não está a esquecer Até o dia que vou voltar